Good evening. <clears throat> Good evening and welcome to Windsor Gospel Assembly's Thursday Night Bible Study. Thank you everyone for being here. And for those of you who are joining us online, we welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Um, once again, it's so good to be in the house of the Lord to study the Word, and we are going to actually see today the importance of the Word. Um, if you're joining us for the first time online, we are Windsor Gospel Assembly. Welcome to our YouTube channel. Uh, you can see more of our content. Uh, we are in the middle of our series called Not Flesh and Blood, where we are talking about spiritual warfare and how the enemy attacks us and traps us and his schemes that he uses to get us away from God. And um, if you would like to know the other things that we have already covered in this series, including our Q&A session that we did a couple of weeks ago, you can always find it on our playlist section and find the playlist called Not Flesh and Blood. And you can also find all the other series that we have done in the past little while. Uh, today we are going to continue in our series uh, on spiritual warfare calling Not Flesh and Blood. And our title for today is Resist. And our title for today is resist. So let's quickly look to the Lord in prayer and then we will dive into our topic for today. Dear God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are here. We thank you that it is in your name that we have victory, dear God, and that it is in your strength that we stand and are able to stand firm against the schemes and the plans of the enemy. God, I pray that you will be with us this evening, dear God. God, I pray for everyone that is gathered here, that is joining us online, or will view this video at a later point in time. God, I pray that uh, I, I pray that you will be with each one of us, dear God, and that your spirit will change something within us. As we study your word, as we focus on what your word has to say, God, give us the wisdom to think through what it is that we are reading. And not just be hearers of the word, but actually put it into practice, dear God. God, we pray that as we look today into how to resist the schemes and the attacks and the wiles of the enemy, dear God, that you will help us to understand that these tools have been provided to us so that we can live for your glory. So that we can actually live a victorious Christian life, standing firm on your promise, dear God. Lord, help us to put on the full armor of God as we've been talking about to resist that which the enemy is trying to do within us and for us to be fruitful for your kingdom. God, I pray for me this evening, dear God, that your presence will be upon me, Lord, that you will grace me, dear God, that, that you will use me regardless of my qualification and regardless of my righteousness, dear God, that your word will help your children come closer to you, dear God. And Lord, I thank you, Lord, that your promises are yes and amen, and that we can trust in who you are and what you have promised to do in us and through us. God, let every discussion, every question that is asked, everything that is shared, Lord, let it all be for the glory of your name. And I pray that you use it uh, miraculously for the extension of your kingdom. For we ask this prayer in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we have been talking about um, <clears throat> the attack of the enemy, and one of the things that we talked about uh, towards the start of our series is we call it the modus operandi, the mode of operation of the enemy, of what is a process he utilizes to take us down. And we went to this passage in James chapter 1, where um, James very clearly writes down what the enemy is hoping of how he's hoping to tempt us and lead us into sin. And so if you could quickly want to turn with me to James chapter 1, I'm going to read from verses 13 to 15. James chapter 1, verses 13 to 15. And James writes this for us. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. And then after the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. 
We talked about this is the process that the enemy uses to lead us towards death. You see, the, the Christ has already won the victory on the cross. Christ has come to give us abundant life. So the enemy can't just destroy our soul. Like he can't just come and say, okay, I'm going to destroy your soul and be done. He wants that, but he cannot do that. The only way he can do that is by first separating us from God. And the only way he can separate us from God is by allowing sin to enter us. And so the progression that James talks about is that sin, when it is full grown, leads to death. You know, Romans says that the wages of sin is death. So there's no world, there's no universe in which sin goes on, but it doesn't lead to death. Sin always leads to death. And the enemy knows this. So the enemy's goal to lead us to death is to lead us into sin. Right? Now the enemy would have us focus on fighting the battles around us and losing the battle of sin within us. We kind of covered this in the past few sessions. But what leads to sin is our evil desires. Okay, and the reason I'm recapping this mode of operation is because today we are going to find the tools in Scripture to resist this plan of attack and for us to resist the attack of the enemy. Okay, so once again, let's follow the progression in verse 14. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. And so, it's very interesting that um, uh, James is saying, goes on to say, don't be deceived. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming from the Father. So he's saying that whatever the enemy is offering, God is offering better. So you don't have to allow your desires, your evil desires to lead you to sin because those desires are a lie. The true fulfillment of our desires is found in what God can give us, not in what the enemy can give us. Right? But let's hold on to that because at the end of the day, it is our evil desires that lead us to sin. Now, I want to continue in James, but I want to jump over three chapters and go to chapter, um, James chapter 4. And that's where we'll get the key text for today as well. But turn with me to James chapter 4, and I will read from verse 1 onwards. And James is literally building a progression here. And he's holding on to that word again, desires. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but you do not have, so you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God, and when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasure. So once again, James is going really hard on us focusing on our desires. Because he says that the more you focus on your desires, the more it will lead to sin. The more you focus on your own pleasure, your, even your prayers from God are going to be not answered because God knows you're asking this for yourself. And then he goes on to say something very interesting about what causes these desires to grow within us, these evil desires. And he says this, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. That's why the scripture says, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Now let me clarify something here, right? James is very clearly saying that friendship with the world means enmity against God. 
Now we talked uh, in our previous series, we talked about friendship versus fellowship and we said they are both good things. Friendship is not a bad thing. It's just that fellowship and godly fellowship is something we must desire more than worldly friendships. But here Paul is, uh, sorry, here James is saying that friendship with the world is enmity with God. So what, what, what are we missing here? You see, James is not necessarily talking here about being friends with people in the world. What he's saying is being friends with the system of the world. Being friends with the worldly system, the worldly way of thinking, the worldview in which the, everyone outside of Christ thinks. And when you become friends of that, you think, hey, my job can help me get what I want. You know, my connections in the world can help me get what I want. Money can help me get what I want. And suddenly, the world and all these things in the world that the Bible says is passing away become your best friends. Right? So James is saying that if you have chosen to make this world system your friend, you have chosen to become an enemy of God. If you have chosen... To make this world your friend, then you have chosen to make God your enemy. And so we have to be very careful because the more we entangle ourselves into the systems of this world, the more our desires and our evil desires will grow. Let me say that again. The more we make ourselves part of this worldly system, the more our evil desires will grow. You know? Let me tell you something about uh, the casino, right? You know, if the first time you go to the casino, the best thing that can happen to you is that you should lose a lot of money. Then you never go back. But if you go to the casino and you win a little money, now there's that part of you that says, ah, I can win a lot of money. I'll go back, I'll go back, I'll go back. And it becomes an addiction. Right? In the same way, when you work the system of this world and you get what you want, it becomes addictive. And it gets to a point where you start to function in the system of this world to get what you want. And that's when you have played into the enemy's hands because now the enemy is using your desires to lead you to sin, to lead you to death. Right? So you see, the source of the problem is that evil desire that is within us. You know, that corruption exists within us because as a mankind, you know, we entered into sin by disconnecting ourselves from God. Adam and Eve did it in the Garden of Eden. And each of us have done that through our daily choices. But James is saying very clearly that if you become friends with the world, then it will increase these evil desires within you. Eventually, it will lead to sin. Eventually, it will lead to death. And that is the modus operandi. That is the mode of operation of our enemy. Right? But we are here today to talk about how do we resist that? How do we resist that? I mean, we talked a whole lot about this, you know, three or four weeks ago when we talked about how the enemy uses that. We also talked about the three different things that the enemy uses, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. All our evil desires kind of fall into one of these three categories. But now James is going to tell us how to fight against this. Right? And I want us to, the next few verses from James chapter 4, verse 7 to 10. James chapter 4, verses 7 to 10. We'll focus on that. And this has to be our mode of operation to resist the enemy. Okay? So if you really want to resist the devil, this is your passage. Right? Right? Now, when we say resist the devil, it's very easy for us to think, oh, the devil is attacking our 
job, our finances, our career. If we resist the devil, then these things will become okay. But remember, the core of the attack, as we have been talking throughout the series, the enemy wants to attack your soul. So resisting the devil means resisting the corruption within us. Right? Because you could lose your job and still have eternal life. You can lose your money and still have eternal life. You can lose your friends and still have eternal life. You can lose your health and still have eternal life. But you can't lose your soul and have eternal life. That's what Jesus said to the rich fool that what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? Right? So, let's dive into the key text for today and we are going to go really slow in the simple instructions that James was giving. Uh, if you remember when we did the book of James, James is um, like the Proverbs of the New Testament, right? James doesn't go around like uh, Paul making a long argument over three chapters. He writes three verses, simple, um, short wisdom, moves on to the next topic, just like the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament, right? And he bases it heavily on the book of Proverbs and the Sermon on the Mount from Jesus. And that's what this book is based on. Let's start reading. Chapter 4 of James, verse 7. Submit yourselves then to God. Okay? You see what submission does? Submission gets rid of the pride of life. We just talked about this, right? The pride of life. One of those three things that Peter warns us against. And this is how the enemy tempts us. The lust of the eye, the lust of flesh, and the pride of life. But when you submit yourself, you're less focused on winning. You're less focused on looking good. You're more focused on obedience to your master. And so James says, submit yourself then to God. And he goes on to say, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist the devil, resist the devil. That's what we're talking about today, right? Resist. Resist the trap, resist the attack of the enemy, resist his mode of operation. So how do we resist the devil? And when you do, he will Flee from you. Right? So then he goes into the instructions. The first thing he says, come near to God and he will come near to you. Okay? He says, draw near to God and God will draw near to you. You see, we see this in the scripture over and over again. Right? God is the one who is actually pursuing us. He wants us to repent, turn around and come back to Him. And when we turn around and take one step towards Him, He runs towards us. We see this in the story of the prodigal son. When he ran off from home and he did his own thing, he ended up in poverty and misery. But when he decided he was going to go back to his father, the father saw him coming back from a long distance and the father ran towards his son. This is what James is talking about. He says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. See, God doesn't sit and say, that, oh, oh, you sinned? Now you're coming back? Yeah, let's see how good, how come, come all the way. Then he makes us feel guilty about our sinning. And then eventually he accepts us. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that he has already paid for our sins and he runs towards us, he reinstates us, he puts his signet ring and once again reminds everyone that this is my son, this is my daughter. That's the heart of the father that we see exemplified throughout scripture. Whether Old Testament, you read the book of Hosea, the prophet Hosea, or you read New Testament and the example of the prodigal son, you see that heart of God. But you see, coming near to God means certain things. The Israelites knew it. 
and the New Testament church knew it. That God, when He wants to draw close to us, He's not sacrificing His holiness for the sake of being close to us sinners. God is not going to say that, okay, I will give up my holiness, I will give up my righteousness, I will give up my justice, and I will start hanging out with sinners. No, God says that I will maintain my righteousness, I will maintain my justice, I will maintain my holiness and make a way to be with those who are sinners. And how does he do that? He does it by justifying the sinners and cleansing those sinners. You see, without justification and without cleansing, we can't draw close to God. And for us to be justified, we have to embrace what Christ has done on the cross. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin, the Bible says. The, the blood of goats and rams could not take away the sin of mankind. But only the perfect lamb, Jesus Christ himself, who is God himself, when he died in our place, he became the propitiation, the full payment of all our sins, and because we trust in Him, we can come to God. If you remember the armor of God, one of the things in there is the helmet of salvation. Okay? How do we put on that helmet? You believe in Jesus Christ. And when you believe in Jesus Christ, you have to submit to God. It's not your way. You didn't earn it. You didn't find a way. God has made a way. And you are agreeing with God. That's what's happening. So, to come near to God, we have to be justified. But God doesn't just save us and leave us as sinners who continues to sin. Rather, every time you see Jesus in the New Testament forgiving people of sin, typically, there's a healing that uh, accompanies it. He says, Go and sin no more. He said that to the woman caught in adultery. He said something similar to the periplegic. He said, your son, your sins are forgiven. So you see, God doesn't just want to justify us. He also wants to sanctify us. Where He starts to make us more and more like Jesus. So James follows the very same uh, progression of thought. And he says, come near to God and he will come near to you. And then he says, wash your hands, you sinners. You see, James is not trying to make people feel good about themselves by denying the fact that we are sinful people. He accepts, just like Paul accepts that, oh, I'm the chief of sinners. Just like John writes, if any of us sin, we can confess. So the, so the New Testament is not trying to hide the fact that even when we accept Christ, we still enter sin, as each of us can testify from our own lives. But what James is saying is, wash your hands, you sinners. You see, in the Old Testament, we find this principle when they came to Mount Sinai and, and God told the whole of Israel that that consecrate yourself, cleanse yourself, purify yourself, and then come to the temple, the mountain of God. Right? So coming to God means we have to evaluate our own hearts. This is why Paul writes when he's talking about communion, the Lord's Supper, he says, let us each one of us examine ourselves. So we see that James follows the same progression of thought and says that to come near to God, we have to wash our hands. What does wash your hands mean? Okay, See, hands are about action. It's about things we've done. Which means, James is saying, stop doing the sinful things that you do if you want to draw near to God. Okay? 
at least make every attempt to live a righteous life make every attempt to imitate your heavenly father i'm not saying that you have to be perfect or that you will accomplish that only by the power of the holy spirit god can lead us out of sin i understand that but you have to make the effort to fight sin just like you wash the hands right you could say that when i wash my hands it's not me that's cleansing the dirt it's the soap it's the water but you still have to put your hands under the tap right in the same way you still have to take your sin you still have to try and make effort and say god help me fight this sin you'll either find the strength to resist your sin or you'll find an excuse to go into sin right it just depends on what you really desire so wash your hands you sinners is about us cleansing our actions us trying to not do what is wrong especially that which we know is wrong and we still do it because we have become slaves to the ones we obey which is our fleshly desire but when we live by the spirit the bible says we will not gratify the desires of the flesh then james goes on to say and purify your hearts you double minded people it's very interesting that he says you know purify wash your hands and purify your hearts you double minded you see sometimes we think that oh we are working for god and yes we have these sins going on on the side but like at least i'm not against god right at least i'm not actively going out there living a sinful life i'm not actively going out there rejecting the name of god i live for god and i live for myself james is saying that is the sign of an impure heart because purify your heart so that you are not double minded you know just like he told us to wash our hands because we are sinners he's telling us to purify our hearts because we are double minded sometimes we want things of god sometimes we want things of the world sometimes we want to help others sometimes we want to be selfish and james is saying make it clear in your heart whose you are and who you want to serve don't be double minded jesus said you know you can't have two masters you will love one and despise the other you will obey one and you will hate the other you can't serve both god and money this is what jesus said you see this picture over and over again throughout the bible joshua stands before the israelites and say that you know if you think serving god is too difficult for you then you choose today whether you want to serve the living god or you want to serve the idols that your ancestors served as for me and my house we will serve the lord excuse me elijah as well on mount carmel say that choose today let's 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 have a showdown is baal god or is yahweh god let's let's decide let's not have this half and half mentality that sometimes i'll serve god other times i'll live for myself sunday mornings thursday night prayer meetings god time every other day of the week my time <laughs> and james is saying no 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 don't be double minded choose one in the book of revelation writing to the church at laodicea jesus says that you're lukewarm at least be warm or cold because you're lukewarm i'm about to spew you out of my mouth so james and the rest of scripture has a big issue with us being double minded half here half there so the bible always says about giving yourselves fully to god submitting yourself surrendering yourself and then he goes on to say grieve mourn and wail why is he saying that in this context now didn't we just study on sunday the joy of the lord is our strength and james is asking us to grieve 
you see sometimes we have this problem that we sin and we are like oh doesn't matter jesus died for me we boast in the grace we show to ourselves and others yeah they are sinning but we are showing grace actually we see this happening in um, in uh, first corinthians when paul writes to the church at corinth right there's this guy that is sleeping with his father's wife and the whole church is saying that oh, yeah he's sinning but we are so gracious we are so graceful look at how much grace god has given us that we can still love this person who is sinning in this way and paul's like really this kind of sin doesn't even happen with the pagans and you are tolerating it within the church cast this person out You see, sometimes we find joy in the fact that we are sinning, and God is gracious. And James is like, "No, no, no! If you're living a sinful life, at least humble yourself, grieve, mourn, wail. Let your heart be broken by the fact that there is sin within us. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom." humble yourselves before the lord and he will lift you up you see in this process you know what will happen as you submit yourself to god as you try to get rid of sin there's only one way you will be able to get rid of sin is if you say that you know these desires i have i will not fulfill it i don't i yeah the desires are there i will not fulfill it i will work against fulfilling these evil desires because i want them to starve and die i will work against running after money i will be generous i will give to god i will give my money and my time to god because i don't want to become a slave to money and my schedule and when you actively fight against the desires and you submit your desires and your resources and what you have to god you see those desires those those evil desires start to starve and when your evil desires starve there is no nothing that can lead to sin and that is to share this illustration and i'll i'll share that with you there was this group of monks who were traveling through the forest it was a very hot summer day you know it was a dry forest and as they were going they saw that behind them is this forest fire that is coming towards them the wind is blowing towards them and there is this forest fire and they are trapped and all the monks are really scared of what to do and then this one monk who was very wise he kind of ran ahead in the direction of the wind and he took out a match and he lit the path ahead of him on fire and all the other monks thought oh you're crazy what's going on there's fire behind us and now you've lit fire ahead of us but as they waited they saw that this fire was coming this way and the fire that this monk had lit was burning and going away from them and eventually as they walked in that direction they stepped onto this land which was just ashes and burnt and when the fire behind them came it stopped because there was nothing left to burn there you see our evil desires are that straw that get lit on fire which leads to sin you see we always try to control our sin but we don't like getting rid of our evil desires and we keep failing and we keep failing and we keep failing instead of holding on to your evil desires when you get rid of the evil desires and allow god to replace it with the desires of god the desires for the kingdom of god seeking his righteousness first then there is no evil desire left for sin to activate that is what james is saying here saying wash your hands submit yourself to god don't be double minded don't rejoice because of your sin 
Instead, humble yourself before God and He will lift you up. He will lift you up. We know the modus operandi of the enemy. He's going to use our evil desires against us. We know this. He's going to bring us opportunity for us to use our, for us to run after our evil desires through an ungodly manner. He will lead us into sin and that sin will lead to death. That's the reality. We want to sometimes fight sin. We want to get rid of death, but we don't want to get rid of the evil desires within us. But without getting rid of the evil desires, sin will always be right there to encroach us and drag us down, to entice us. That's why the, Jesus said that if anyone wants to follow me, they must deny themselves. What does it mean to deny themselves? To give up something that you want. What is the next step? To carry your cross. See, sometimes we think that denying ourselves is the big thing, right? That, oh, if I just deny myself, I'll somehow... That doesn't work. You have to deny yourself and replace it with desires for God. You have to deny yourself and allow God to put in desires into your heart. So let's talk about this specifically. Let's talk about this practically. And we will see how when we talk about the armor of God, a lot of those things tie into what James just said about resisting the devil. Okay. The first thing in the armor of God is the belt of truth. So the enemy likes to lie. The enemy doesn't tell us that, oh, you are sinning. The enemy says that, do this and God is okay with it. So the enemy li doesn't like the label of sin. The enemy likes to tell us that whatever wrong we are doing, God is okay with it. Right? He tried to tempt Jesus in the same way. Right? And Jesus resisted the devil. And we will get to that in a little while. But the belt of truth is so important because if you have started to believe the lies that the world is saying, you will not even classify those desires as evil. You're going to look at those desires and say that it's okay. It's a blessing. Everyone does that. Everybody wants that. It's just living life. It's just how life works. And we find all these lies to justify our evil desires. The truth is important. Truth is so important. Because if you don't recognize that desire as evil, then the enemy has already tricked you and you're not even being able to see what the problem is. In Romans chapter 14, verse 23, turn with me to Romans chapter 14, verse 23, and I'll... So Paul is talking about eating meat versus not eating meat, and uh, he talks about in very much detail how you must not cause a brother to stumble. But he says something very interesting towards the end of it. He says, in the end of 23, he says, and everything that does not come from faith is sin. Think of that. 
everything that does not come from faith is sin. What does that mean? You see, there's no neutral things on this earth. Either you're serving God or you're acting against God. So we have to be very careful about how we live. And truth is very important because the enemy would lie to us and tell us that it's okay to live a particular way when it's really not. Because it's not really what God expects of us. The next article in the armor of God is the breastplate of righteousness. This is what James wrote as, wash your hands, you sinners. You see, doing what is right will cause the enemy to flee from you. Bible also says if anyone knows what is right and does not do it, that is sin. Let me quickly find that passage. It's in James itself, James chapter 4, verses 17. He says, If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. You see that? You see, doing good is so important. And we, as believers, we often say that this is not a works-based salvation. You don't have to do anything to earn salvation. And that is very true. We are saved by, by faith alone, through grace alone. However, we are not saved by grace that is alone. It is a grace that always accompanies good works. And James says this, right? You show me your faith, I will show you my faith through my deeds. So the breastplate of righteousness is us doing the right thing which protects us from the enemy again. So you have to function in truth. You have to function in doing what is right. If you're not doing what is right, you say, oh, someone pressured me, or I just did what, I just went with the flow, oh, but I really believe it is wrong, and I really believe God. It's not good enough. You've already given into the plans of the enemy because you've taken your breastplate of righteousness and put it aside. You're walking in a war zone with a bare chest, hoping that nothing will hit you. The third thing that Paul, uh, uh, Paul writes in Ephesians is readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. You see, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Good news is not something you keep to yourself. Good news is something you share. Good news is something you are always ready to share. Right? Us being ready with the gospel... That is important. See, John Piper says this thing. He says that preach the gospel to yourself daily. Do we remind ourselves daily that I am a sinner and Christ is a great savior, that I am a sinner and Jesus has purchased me? Remind yourself this daily and see how the evil desires loses its grip on you. Anytime you go to sin, you're like, oh, I just reminded myself. This is why Jesus had to die for me. You will resist sin. But the thing is, every time we think about the gospel, we think, oh yeah, you know, 20 years ago I accepted Christ. That is the gospel. No, the gospel is today. The gospel is relevant to me today. I must preach the gospel to myself daily that I am a sinner and Jesus died for me so that I could be made a son and or daughter of the living God. The shield of faith. You see, the shield of faith is what helps us to put out the flaming arrows that the enemy fires at us. 
You see, we just read, right, that any action that is not prompted by faith is sin. You see, when you don't have faith, how do you function? You function on your own intellect. You function on the pattern of the world. You, you think, how do others deal with this situation? I too will deal in the same way. And so you are making friends with the world system. You are drawn into the world's way of thinking. It leads to a place where you end up going into sin. But when you function in faith, you are not using the world's logic. You are not using your own intellect. You are obeying what God has told you. And that sets you apart from the world. And when it sets you apart from the world, then the enemy cannot use that to entice you into sin. But when you are functioning in the worldly system, chances are at every corner there is an opportunity to sin. The helmet of salvation, we already talked about submitting to God. The salvation message. Because it gets rid of your pride, the pride of life. Because you're only putting your hope in God. And this year, what I'm going to end with is the most powerful weapon to actually resist sin and to resist the enemy. And Paul writes, that is the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Let me pause and ask, what's your relationship with the word of God. How often do you read the Bible? Are, are you going to Bible just to memorize? Or are you going to Bible to actually make daily decisions? Are you letting the Holy Spirit use the scriptures to actually shape how you decide each day of your life? Ask yourself the simple question, which of my actions today was based on scripture? At what point today did I say, no, this is what the Bible says, I'll do this. At which point today you use scripture to calm yourself down and say that, no, I know the truth about this. At which point today someone acted towards you in one way and you acted towards them in accordance to scripture because you were reminded of what was written in the Bible. Ask yourself, what is your relationship with the Bible? You know, like in, a, in every workplace, you know, we have these manuals, right? And at the first, when you start to use an instrument or any process, you refer to the manual a lot. After that, it becomes muscle memory. You just go ahead and do it. But then you come to a unique part of that particular uh, process and you have to go back to the manual. Our relationship with the Bible should be the same. Which is that you read it so much and you act on it so much that it becomes a part of you. But still, you should keep reading it so that when you encounter something new, you can always go back to the Word of God as a reference and figure out what it is that God's will is for you in this particular situation. Turn with me to Psalms 119. You, most of you know this passage. It's a very famous one. Psalms 119 verse 9 to 16 David writes about his relationship with the law of God, with the word of God. And once again, you will see how this is tied towards purity and avoiding sin. It's the same thing. It's not that you are, you know, the Satan shows up and you quote some verses and he falls down. It's not about that. It's about you reading the word of God so that you are very much clear how you can control your desires and not go into sin. You see, when Jesus quoted scripture at Satan, it's not like, oh, Jesus quoted a verse, Satan fell down. Jesus quoted verses to justify his own behavior of why he was not acting the way the Satan was asking him to act. So Jesus quoted the scriptures about his own actions. Right? And David here is saying the same thing. 
verse 9, Psalms 119. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to the word. Right? Not just knowing it, not just talking about it, but by living according to your word, the psalm writer says. He goes on to say, I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I have hidden the word in my heart that I might not sin against you. You see, is there a sin that has going over and over again in your life? Find everything the Bible has to say about that and hide it. Not just so that you can quote it, but so that you can use it. As I keep saying, the heart, when the Bible says the heart, it's not talking about your emotions. It's not talking about, you know, this pumping organ that pumps blood. The Bible is talking about the seat of intelligence. The part of me that takes my emotions, my information, the voice of God, the written word into account and then decides what I'm going to do. What David is pretty much saying is that the word of God is so close to my decision making part of my mind that the first thing I think is what does the Bible say? Not what do others say? Not what is the advice of consultants in this world, but what does the Bible say? That's the first thought that should come to your mind when you're making any decision in your life. And that's why David says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. Have you met some people who follow the word of God but they are the most sad thing about them is that they have to follow the word of God? Long faces like, oh, I would love to do that. Oh, but the Bible doesn't allow me to do it. I would love to go that but oh, the Bible doesn't let me. God has given so many rules. I wish those rules weren't there. See, they just know the word. They are not joyful about it. David is not like that. David says, I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. So David's mindset is that, yeah, I see how everyone else is behaving. But I have this amazing secret information that God has given me. And I will live according to God's secret information. Now, it's not a secret. We all know it. But the world is blinded to it. And it is something that we have access to. But his excitement is like, oh, I have this rich wealth of information that I can act upon that the world does not have. And I will happily follow these instructions from the Lord. He's happy about living according to God's decrees. And he says, I meditate on your precepts and I consider your ways. I delight in your decrees and I will not neglect your word. You see, we can't, the evil part of us will always fight. You know, the flesh is, the dead flesh is always there trying to drag us back into sin. Until Christ returns, that part is still very much here. But the more you starve it, the more you saturate your thinking and your behavior by the word of God, the less power that flesh will have over you. And when your evil desires start to fade away, sin starts to fade away, the enemy has to flee. To resist the enemy you must do what James says and what Paul says, which is to submit to God, wash your hands, cleanse, purify your hearts, draw near to Him and He will draw near to you. Humble yourself and God will lift you up. And Paul says, put on the full armor of God. You see, it is very interesting 
for us to read in the word and find what it is that we have been told of how we can resist the devil. To resist the devil, we must live according to the word of God. You know, I was sharing uh, the title of today's topic with Jude and Jude uh, sent me uh, a screenshot of the Borg. The Borg is this villain character in um, a Star Trek, okay? And they have this tagline, right? You will be assimilated, resistance is futile, right? Their whole, they are so powerful that the first thing they tell their enemies is that no point in fighting us, you will lose, Right? The enemy may tell us the same lies. No, no need to resist, you will lose. Don't try to fight against your evil desires, you will lose. Don't try to fight against sin, you will lose. But the truth, the voice of truth says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. You see, at the end of the temptation of Jesus, when Jesus quoted the word and justified his behavior, at the end of it, it says, then the, then the Satan left him alone and angels came and tended to him. Give a high priority to the word of God in your life. Don't just know it. Don't just talk about it. Meditate on it and live according to it. Let the first thought that comes to you be, what does the Bible say about this topic? Then start, to meditate, then, just, then start to model your behavior according to those principles and do it joyfully. And as you put on the full armor of God and as you allow the Spirit of God to use the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, God will sanctify you. And as you are sanctified, the grip of your evil desires goes away. And once the evil desires goes away, sin goes down. And when sin goes down, death goes away. That is how God sanctifies us. And that's how we can resist the devil. Not by throwing scripture at him, but rather by internalizing scriptures for ourselves and living according to the scriptures. When we do that, we can resist the devil and he will flee from us. Let's look to Lord in prayer. Dear God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time you have given us. God, I pray that you will help us to shape our life in accordance to the word of God. You will help us to live in a way that is pleasing to you, dear God. Lord, we recognize that the enemy uses our evil desires, our lust of the eyes, our lust of the flesh and the pride of life to lead us away from you, dear God. The enemy uses this to entrap us so that our evil desires will lead to sin and sin will lead to death. But God, I pray instead that we will dive into the word of God, that we will submit ourselves to you, that we will mourn and weep about our sin, that we will, we will wash our hands, that we will be, do the, what is righteous, what is right, that in our hearts we will set apart Christ as Lord, and we will be steadfast, towards the Lord and we will give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord, not being double-minded, dear God, that our hearts may be purified. Lord, and as we humble ourselves, dear God, Lord, we know that it is you who lift us up. Lord, let us not fight for our own pride, but let us surrender our victory to you, knowing that it is you who is victorious and we share in your victory, dear God. God, I pray that we will give a high importance to the word in our life, dear God. That we will not be um, that we will not be tempted to just do things in our own intelligence and in our own actions, dear God, by worldly precepts and worldly concepts and worldly wisdom and what works in the world. But instead, we will pray, and that we will, or that we will make decisions based on what it is that you have called us to do. Lord, let your word have, be so saturated in our life, dear God, that every thought, Lord, is cross-referenced based on the word of God. 
Lord, as we go to our homes this evening, Lord, we pray that you will be with us. Help us to remember that which we have learned, Lord. Help us to implement and act and live according to what we have learned today, dear God. And Lord, we pray for everyone that is here, everyone that is online or maybe watching this video at a later point in time, Lord, that you be with them. Keep them safe and sound and let your word penetrate into their hearts that none of us may sin against you, dear God. Lord, we promise to give you all glory and honor and praise because we recognize that it is you and you alone who deserve it. And until we meet again, dear God, let your grace and mercy abide with us and let your spirit continue to lead us into all truth and continue to sanctify us in more and more into the likeness of Jesus Christ. In all of this, Lord, we pray that your name be praised, for we ask this prayer in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you once again, everyone that's gathered here and everyone that joined us online. Once again, in a couple of weeks, we'll have our Q&A night. So if you have questions that you weren't able to ask today, collect them, but you'll have a chance of asking them in a couple of weeks. Until we meet again, God bless and take care.